are in the middle of a sermon series, an expository series on the book of Jonah, uh, but that's not what we're going to be talking about today. Um, yeah, some of you are chuckling. I'm nervous up here, but part of what we're going to be talking, not part of what we're going to be talking about today, what we will be talking about today is I'm going to be addressing something that I call uh, the political spirit or the spirit of division is another way that we can talk about it. Um, this is in light of uh, what stirred it up in me and what brought this forward in me and prompted me with the Lord to talk about this um, is the recent assassination attempt on Donald Trump, one of the people who's up for election. And for those of you who are already starting to tune out because I said anything remotely political, come back in. <laughs> We are going to be talking about some stuff. I'm going to be challenging us today. Um, I'm grieved. People have been checking in on me this morning because I kind of wear my emotions on my sleeve. So people are looking at me and like, Aaron, what's going on? I'm grieved. I'm grieved for a lot of things, but I I'm grieved that we as the church, and here's part of what I'm going to be talking about, we as the church are complicit in our culture getting to the point where this would happen. We are complicit in this. We're complicit because when we had opportunities to speak up before, We've chosen not to. Yep. We're complicit because we've allowed the spirit of the age to drive how we have conversations with people. Aaron, how do you know that? Because Christianity has become more synonymous with a voting block than it has become with the man Jesus in our country. And when I bring up points like that, people will say, well, that's people's misconception of what we're about. Yes, that's true. The question that I would ask you is, what have we been showing them? What have we been giving them to work off of in terms of discerning what Christianity is all about? If I'm to walk into the Galleria right now and pull the next 20 to 100 people, what do you think Christianity is about? How would you describe Christians? Love is not gonna be on the top of the list. And we actually sacrifice our authority to speak into culture and to speak into people's lives when we continually kick that can down the road and make that somebody else's problem. Yeah. Come on now. And we engage with the spirit of division by continually making that somebody else's problem. Right. We hear about how Christians are perceived. We hear, and let me be clear, people can have misconceptions about you and me and that's fine. But when the way that we live in the world chooses, like it represents Jesus in a certain way, when the way that we live and move in the world reflects on Jesus, and people would tend to think that Jesus cares more about who you're checking next to on a ballot, than on even the state of their souls. That's on us. And that's because we have chosen to engage with the world on the world's terms. I'm going to break down a lot of stuff today. And again, like I said, I'm grieved. I'm raw. This will probably feel a little bit more all over the place than I even am on a usual given Sunday. But I'm going to go after some stuff. And for those of you who 
want to say, well, give me a chapter and a verse. Part of what we're going to be doing today, to step on my nerd soapbox here for a second, part of what we're doing today is called pastoral theology. How do you take everything, how do you take the witness of scripture, how scripture tells us to live and act and move in the world across you know, the whole New Testament, the story that God's telling from the Old Testament to the New, how do you take all of that and say, okay, how then do I live and interact with the world in this moment that the, that the culture is in? So we're gonna be going to a lot of different places. I'm gonna be covering a lot of different things, but we have to go after this and I wanna go after this now, not you know, a week away from when we have to go to the ballots and not a week away from when there's an election. And it's important now because you think that people got stirred up just because of the assassination attempt. If the last several decades have showed us anything, it's that election seasons get crazier and crazier. And if we are given in to a spirit of division, to a political spirit, then the way that we talk to and engage with people, and even the way that we receive factual information is gonna be colored by that and not colored by the kingdom of God. Am I making sense? So Jesus help me, amen. <laughs> just to define some terms and give some clarity. When I say a spirit of division or when I say a political spirit, I'm not saying that if I were to start trying to cast demons out of people that I would name a political spirit and then somebody would start shrieking and you know there'd be a deliverance in here. But there's a concept that's taught within scripture that starts with 2 Corinthians 10, three through five, and I'll just read it. For although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh, since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So it's talking about the mind, strongholds of the mind, thoughts. And when you pair this with Ephesians 6, 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. One of the ways that the enemy attacks, that the enemy works, we, it's not just in one-on-one -on -one spiritual oppression, spiritual attack, demonic oppression. It's not just that. One of the ways that the enemy works is through demonically inspired, demonically infused ways of thinking that we would call a stronghold. Am I making sense? So when I'm talking about a spirit of division, it's a shorthand for that demonically inspired way of thinking whose end goal and only end is division between brothers and sisters, division in the church, division in nations, for the sake of infighting and destruction. That's what I'm talking about. And this is important. And why am I even going after this? And why does this seem so nebulous? Or like, why am I getting so nitty gritty on this? Because ways of thinking become ways of living. Yeah. Ways of thinking become ways of living. And if the way that you think about the truth, if the way that you think about God, if the way that you think about the way he's called you to live in the world comes through the lens of a spirit of division or a political spirit, then you can have the right facts but have the wrong spirit in how you relate to people. Come on. Exactly. Aaron, where do you see that in scripture? I'm glad you asked. One of the classic cases is when the Pharisees bring this woman caught in adultery before Jesus. And they say, teacher, the law says that we should stone her. What do you say? They're trying to trap him because Jesus knows what the law says. And they know that Jesus knows what the law says. The law says she's caught in adultery. She deserves to be stoned. They had their facts right. But what does Jesus say? You who are without sin, cast the first stone. 
And then he bends down in the dirt and looks this woman in the eye and says, where are your accusers? Nowhere, Lord. Then neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus didn't only have the facts and the truth, he had the Father's heart. He had the right way of taking in the facts, taking in the truth, and then living that and releasing that into the world. And the Pharisees, all throughout Scripture, are a classic example of you can have your facts right, but miss the heart of the Father completely in how you live and how you relate to people. So it's important that we get this, and I'm, I'm pointing this stuff out and breaking it down because this way of thinking, this spirit of division is so insidious and it starts small. And if I can drive one point home today, it starts with fear. Just a small snapshot is we are afraid, if we're just going to talk about even America right now, we're afraid that we'll either lose the America we grew up with, or if we're afraid of the America that will be coming down the road. And so when we, but here's the thing, when we give into that fear and allow that fear to be the driving force behind how we make decisions, who we support, and how we relate to people, this is where division comes in. We start to draw lines that the kingdom of God does not draw. And when we start, here's the thing, when we start to draw those lines, it opens us up and sets us up for idolatry because fear is what drove us to make those lines and those divisions in the first place that God was not making. So when we try to look to God to say, give me validation for the lines that I just drew, he tends to be silent. So when you're looking for validation on those lines that you drew, that again, the kingdom did not draw, you have to start looking to anything other than God to give you validation for why you're drawing those lines. the easiest thing to look to in our culture is your political party. If you think that the kingdom of God can fit squarely within a Republican or Democratic denomination, your view of the kingdom is astronomically too small. Some of you are going to be asking the question, well, but I still have to make a choice. I still have to make a decision. Yes. And I'm not getting into that part today, but what I am getting into and addressing is there is a heart that we approach these issues with that have, for many of us and many in our culture, start with the understanding that I know that I'm right because of how wrong the other side is. rather than I'm voting based off of convictions because I've looked the man Jesus in the face and said, how do I follow you and how do I live? You tell me how this needs to go and I'll follow you. But instead we look to, again, anything else, anyone else. The political spirit, the spirit of division, is something that has actually been going after the church since its, since its inception. If you read through Acts, if you read through any of the epistles, the amount of times that Paul has to tell the church you need to prioritize unity tells us that there was probably a unity issue. And moreover, how the Bible tells us to deal with people who have a divisive spirit tells us how seriously the Lord takes us. Second Corinthians says, you know, it, 
do not receive a divisive person after one and two warnings. If you're sowing division within the body, Paul says, you get two warnings, third strike, you're out. Until you take ownership for what you're doing, then you can come back in. This is how seriously the Lord takes division. This is how much it grieves him. And here's something else. How many of you guys are original language nerds? Probably all two of you, me being one of them. <laughs> Something interesting here. Revelation 12, 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come. Listen here. Because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. That Greek word for accuser, when, and when we say the accuser of the brethren, we're talking about Satan. We're talking about the devil, the enemy of our souls. That word for accuse and accuser is this Greek word kategorin, which is where we get our English word category. So part of what we do when we're shifting people into categories, drawing lines that the kingdom of God is not drawing. We're partnering with the accuser. That's not to say that there isn't truth. That's not to say that there isn't right and wrong. But again, the way that the thing in so many of our hearts that it is how we approach these conversations is, I'm not that group, therefore I'm right. I'm not that group, therefore I'm okay. And the way that we actually start to form our identities, we get this understanding of who we are and how we're supposed to be in the world based on what we disagree with rather than who we're following. And the church, again, we engage with this way of thinking. We're complicit in this. I'm going to knock on the door of a few other sacred cows, if you don't mind. <laughs> there have been a lot of prophecies released about the election about who's supposed to be in office. I'm gonna make a couple of notes here. First, before I get into my main point, is scripture does tell us, don't despise prophecies, but test everything. Yep. What I've seen a lot of people do is they just wait for their favorite prophetic voice on the internet to release a word about who's supposed to be in office. And instead of weighing anything, they're just like, yep, God said it. When really what's happening, I think for a lot of us, I can't speak for everybody. What I think is happening for a lot of us is we're looking for God to be on our side. We've got a way that we think this should go and we're waiting for anybody to tell us God says you're right. Now let me be clear, let me be crystal clear. I believe in the prophetic. I believe that the Lord does still speak about stuff like this, that the Lord even does still speak on national levels. But I think that there's something in our hearts about how we've addressed the prophetic in this arena as believers, that's actually indicative of problems that go even farther back. I think that when we look at the political arena, when we look at culture in general, we are so aware of how little authority we have to speak into it, that the moment somebody said, hey, this guy's a, this guy's a Christian, and I think God's saying that he's gonna be in office. We were so aware of how much authority we've lost to speak to the world that the moment somebody gave a prophetic word, we're like, yep, that's the word of the Lord. 
because we're looking for a prophetic word to shortcut us back into a place of influence. You only have authority to speak to what you love. And a lot of how, again, part of why this is a hard message to give is because there's so much complexity here. And I'm aware of that. But the culture really has no reason to listen to us because we've done very little to love the culture. And it's much easier to look at people and tell them how wrong they are and how right we are and tell them that because we're right, you need to listen to us. When all we've done is beat them over the head with Bible verses, beat them over the head with truth. All the while giving them the example that this must be how Jesus feels about them. Because this is how his people treat me. How do we know that there's fear at the root of this division and there's fear at the root of how we relate to the world? 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. So when there's the absence of those things, probably tells us fears there, am I right? Have you seen much power in terms of how the body is relating to culture? No. We're growing in it, but no. How much love have you seen? Precious little. How much sound judgment have you seen in how we relate? Nervous laughter. The way that we speak to people, the way that we speak about our leaders, whether we agree with them or not, has got anything but sound judgment written over the top of it. <clears throat> Here's something else that I want you to chew on. Part of why we we do this and another part where fear has crept in is we're so afraid of people disliking us when we disagree with them that that's part of why it's easier to just lump people into categories and accuse and divide because when I do that it doesn't require me to have a hard conversation with you but when we do that we lose our authority to speak into much of anything it will always be easier to accuse and divide because then I have no responsibility to talk to you to figure out what do you actually think? What are you actually experiencing? What do you actually believe? Because I can assign a label to you, determine I know everything there is to know about that label, and then use that as a reason to say, I don't need to talk to you because I already know what you believe because you're a fill in the blank. when we start to come out from underneath this thing is when we realize that if we're asking if God's on our side, we're asking the wrong question. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Joshua 5, 13 through 14. This gets at some of what I'm talking about. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua approached him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. I have now come as commander of the Lord's army. Then Joshua bowed with his face to the ground in homage and asked him, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? Most of the time, 
what I see in myself, what I see in other people, other believers, is we feel very justified in how we talk to people, how we treat people, how we relate to people, because we come with this assumption, I bear the name Christian, therefore God is on my side. And part of what's interesting about the passage of scripture that I just read is God did help them overcome and defeat Jericho. But Joshua was asking the wrong question. It's not, God, are you on my side? It's, God, where are you? What are you doing so that I can get on your side? The, the degree to which we give into and participate in a divisive spirit, the degree to which we do that reveals how short-sighted we are. We will have petty arguments about politics, about policy, about all these different things with brothers and sisters in the Lord who sit across the aisle from us and forget that in 100 years for most of us, just to cover you know, the wide age range from older to younger, in 100 years, we're all going to be standing next to each other worshiping the same lamb. And what we, I'll, I'll say it another way, what we allow and participate in the church is a witness to the world of what our king is like. I could potentially, maybe, have some level of understanding for the kind of immaturity that I see from believers in terms of interacting with non-believers. Like, maybe there's some twisted way you could get an excuse for that kind of immaturity. But when we do that to each other, that's a witness to the world. And we tell them, yeah, Jesus is awesome and he really loves you. And all the information that we're giving them says, as soon as you step in here, it's just another firefight where you need to pick another side. This is not the end of a conversation, at least I hope it's not. Part of why we've gotten to this place in our country is because we're not looking for anybody to teach us how to think, we're looking for everybody to tell us what to think. So this should be a conversation starter for you. And it has been for me. And if you want, like, this is one of the things that grieves me so much. You would think that an assassination attempt in our country on a political figure in the upcoming presidential election, you would think that that would be enough to snap a lot of people out of the craziness. It didn't take more than 24 hours for people to start using it on both sides of the aisle as validation for why they're right. One man died, and another was literally centimeters away from losing his life. But we seem to be very comfortable using that kind of a situation, putting whatever spin on it we need to, and using it as validation for politics. So how do we move forward? How do we move out of 
the fear that brought us here? How do we start to break ourselves out of this way of thinking? And what does God call us to? I think there's a few ways that we can do this. First, is you have to remember where he is leading us, where this is all headed. Revelation 21, one through three, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. After this, I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches. Where the Lord is leading his people, where the Lord is leading history, you will not care whether you voted Republican or Democrat. Where the Lord is leading us, there is a complete absence of division and category. And again, some of you are, I can feel some of you, you're like, well, tell me what to do. Tell me what to think. Tell me just what I'm supposed to do so I don't have to wrestle with this. I, you're going to need to wrestle with it. Because some of you are starting to ask the question of like, well, but isn't some of this important? Doesn't some of this stuff matters? I've heard it said this way. If, if one thing matters, then everything matters. Yep. It's all important. And God does have thoughts and ideas and ways that we're supposed to interact, ways that we're supposed to move in the world. But what I'm addressing again is the heart behind how we tend to approach these decisions. If you can keep the end in mind and know where he's leading us, you understand, and know, let's take even one step to the side here. God gets to write the story, which means he gets the dream of his heart at the end of all of this. Yeah. And the dream of his heart, every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, every that. When you have that in your heart and in your mind, when you're not just voting, but when you're relating to people and having dialogue about policy, having dialogue about all this stuff, you realize that God's highest order of priority is we are all coming underneath the man Jesus. Ephesians tells us that he tore down the wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile and that we're becoming one new man in him. When you have that understanding, I now do not get the luxury of choosing to write you off because you disagree with me. Here's this one. This one is nuts to me. Both the spirit and the bride say come. Revelation 22, 17. Let anyone who hears say come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life freely. We hear that quoted in scripture. We hear that in songs all the time. Let the spirit and the bride say come. This is at the end of Revelation. This is actually a prophetic text. Do you know what this means? This means that the Lord is actually taking his body, taking his bride to the place where across the world, we can actually hear what the Spirit is saying and all come into all of us. That's every denomination, every branch of the Christian family tree. We can come and agree and say, God, the Spirit is saying the time is now. Meanwhile, we still have disagreements about what color the church carpet should be. When you remember where he's leading us and remember how important this kind of unity is to him, 
you can begin to break down that stronghold of division. You can begin to break down that stronghold of that political spirit. What's another way that we can do this? The other part that we have to get with this is remember how he's called us to move in this world. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Let's just stop there for a second. Paul is saying to the Corinthian church, in light of what Jesus has done, you have zero right to relate to anybody from a purely fleshly perspective. We regard no one according to the flesh because I grew up on KJV and that's how it's stuck in my brain. Some of you can identify with my pain. <laughs> Paul's giving instruction. He's describing himself and he's giving them instruction. The way that you see people, you are not allowed to see them strictly through what's in front of you. You have to start in light of, who, in light of what Jesus did, in light of who God is and how he feels about them. That is your starting point. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. meaning he took that, gave it, to the, gave it to the church, said, this is yours to carry. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here's what's true about you 100% of the time. You are an ambassador for Jesus. Here's why that should put the fear of God in you. That is true of you 100% of the time. We do not get to pick and choose when we are representing him. He so loves us, so trusts us, and is so intimately tied his name to his people that how you live your life every second of every day is a reflection of who he is for good or for bad. Yep. Come on. So when we engage with this kind of division, when we engage with this sort of political spirit, what we are releasing into the atmosphere and what we are teaching people is that Jesus is okay with this kind of division. In 1 Corinthians, Paul takes the first three chapters to deal with a situation that feels probably somewhat similar to what we're going through right now. Some of you say, I follow Paul. Some of you say, I follow Apollos, or I follow Christ. He goes and he says, I'm sorry, was Paul crucified for you? Did Apollos die for you? And then he goes in and he is very clear with them. When I was with you, I had to give you milk and not solid food because you engaging in this kind of division speaks to how immature you are. We need him to help us grow up. And here's part of what's sad about this kind of division that we're seeing. We see it and we get so entrenched on the sides that we're in because we actually care deeply. 
you only fear of losing something that you love and that you care about. So what's sad about this is that rather than taking that fear about how things are going to the Lord and saying, Lord, what are you doing and what do I need to do to partner with you? We jump straight into control and straight into division. Because if I can divide you, you, and you into another camp because you make me feel uncomfortable and say, you stay over there with all the other bad people because I disagree with you, that makes us feel safe all of a sudden. And again, the whole time we do it, do you realize that your life matters? Do you realize that the way that you treat and relate to people matters? He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. And as I was studying and looking at even some of the Greek, that word reconciliation is like a mirror image. It's the exact opposite in Greek of accusation. Instead of splitting people out, it's drawing them into one. So the way forward, you remember where he's leading you, where he's taking us. You remember what he's called you to do and how he's called you to be. And here's where the rubber meets the road. You have to let that seep into your relationships. The world does not know believers as people who can disagree with them and still love them. All I have to do is go look at Facebook four years ago (laughs) to tell you that I'm right. (laughs) When you understand who you are and who you belong to, people disagreeing with you does not completely shake your identity anymore. That's a muscle that has to be flexed. And if we want authority to speak to people, if we want authority to speak into culture, we have to start actually talking to people and hearing them. You have to start building relationships with people who, where their views and their worldview makes you uncomfortable. Because here's the other insidious thing about a political spirit and a divisive spirit. I am gonna land the plane soon because I could keep talking. (laughs) Here's one of the things that's dangerous about that. Not only do we start pointing the finger at other people, saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you stay over there, I'm gonna stay over here on my island of correctness, is that as you do that, you just throw yourself deeper and deeper and deeper into your own echo chamber. And then you realize all of a sudden, man, I'm in this Christian community and nobody's disagreed with me for the last four years. Nobody's rubbed me the wrong way. Nobody's challenged me. Nobody's presented any sort of new thought. Which is another way of saying nobody's invited you to repent in four years. We have to turn from our idols of comfortability and our fear back to following Jesus. And again, I think we get so passionate about this, partially because deep in our core, we're aware of a lot of what I've talked about and we're aware of how far we've fallen. 
So we're just hoping that if we get the right person in the office, it'll fix everything. Over 2,000 years, having the quote-unquote right person in the office has never fixed anything. Amen. If anything, if you want to follow history, as soon what history has showed us, and I'm so grateful to be in a country where we can do this, where I can even talk the way that I'm talking right now. There are plenty, plenty of other countries in the world, and I'm aware of this, where me talking like this means as soon as I step out that door, my family doesn't see me again. I'm aware of that. We're not living in the fullness of what he's called us to. And to finish my other thought, what history has shown us is that if anything, the moment we get somebody in leadership that agrees with everything, agrees with our doctrine, calls himself a Christian, all of that, the moment that that happens, we actually start to see decline. We get complacent, yep. And again, to draw us outside of this, the kingdom of God was here long before America came on the scene, and it will be here long after. Amen. So when we get that view, we can set our hearts right, begin actually loving people, begin actually relating to and listening to people who disagree with us, and we can stop contributing to the division that exists in this country. Amen? Amen? I didn't plan it this way, but it's fitting in talking about division and unity that today is actually one of the days that we celebrate communion. So I'm going to ask the ushers to start preparing this. One of the reasons why communion has been sacred throughout church history is specifically because of unity. And even, even this, this thing that God's given us to do, taking the bread, taking the cup, in church history, we've even tried to make divisions over that. Paul talks about in Corinthians that during one of these communion feasts that they had actually fallen into this practice of some of you who are rich and have a lot of money, you show up early, you eat all the bread, drink most of the wine to the point where some of you are getting intoxicated. Meanwhile, those of you who don't have a lot come and don't have much. Part of what communion does and reminds us of is that regardless of where you stand on politics, regardless of where you came from, regardless of your social status, all of us are being joined to the same man. All of us are being joined to Jesus. while the elements are getting passed out. Scripture actually tells us that before we take communion, we are to examine ourselves. And in light of what we've been talking about this morning, we all probably need to do some self-examination. So before we take communion, I'm gonna give us just a few minutes of silence here to just ask the Lord Lord, is there anything between you and me that needs to get taken care of? Is there anything between me and another person that needs to get dealt with before I do this?
Search me, O God, and know me. See if there's any wicked way in me. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken. Jesus, we thank you that you allowed your physical body to suffer division so that your body, your church, wouldn't have to. We thank you that your body was broken so that the veil could be torn, so that there could be unity between man and God again. So Jesus, even as we take the bread today, we ask that you would heal in us where we've given over to division. Heal it in our churches, heal it in our country. And heal our minds, God, as we take the bread, in Jesus' name. Jesus, even as we talk about heavy topics and even as we feel your spirit moving us to repent, convicting us of things where we need to adjust and change the way that we live, we thank you, God, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we thank you that your blood washes us clean completely. Your blood doesn't just cover over. It actually eradicates sin. Your word says, come, let us reason together. Even though your sins are red as scarlet, they will be white as wool. That your blood actually cleanses us completely. So Lord, even as we've repented, we thank you that your blood this blood of the new covenant washes us clean so that we can be united with you and with each other. In Jesus' name. At this time, I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. talked about a lot today. And if I was doing my job right, I've probably made a couple of you upset. <laughs> and I've given us all something to think about, I hope. So we're going to have the prayer team here for some of us. We just need to repent for how we've partnered with this division. To get really specific, we need to repent for how we've spoken of other people and spoken to other people. And the way that that's contributed to this division that we have in our country. So there's gonna be the prayer team up here where if you need to confess, if you need to pray, 
around anything that we talked about today, they're here for you. If you want to know more about Jesus, some of you, this might be the first time you've walked into a church in a long time. If you need to talk to somebody about Jesus and you want to meet him, give your life to him, these people are here for you. If you need healing in your body, healing in your marriage, they're here for you and we want to pray for you. So I'm going to pray for us and I'll dismiss us, okay? So Father, I just thank you for your people. I thank you for your bride. Father, we thank you that you invite us into repentance. God, we thank you for the joy of repentance, that you actually care enough about us to call us into how you've actually designed for us to live and relate to each other. So Lord, I just speak peace and I speak comfort over your people. And Lord, wherever the enemy would try to come in and bring accusation, bring shame, bring fear, bring division, I just speak to all of that and command it to die in the name of Jesus. I release peace over your people. And Holy Spirit, we invite you, draw us closer to Jesus in the middle of things going nuts in our country. Draw us closer to Jesus so that we can follow you and that you would break division in our country, God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Again, we've got our prayer team here to pray for you. If you need prayer, otherwise, be blessed. Go in peace.